how's it going, guys? Uh, Braxton, uh, let me set up a stream um, or video. I well, I have a video actually. Go check out the uh, the office tour. I actually touch on. I'll actually show my drones in that video, uh, talking on uh, uh, basically all the spec. Well, not really all the specs on them, but basically giving you a rundown of everything I got for my drones. So um, you can check out that video. So uh, in the meantime, uh, actually, I could work on that right now also and kind of tag team with you guys on here uh, back and forth. Um the new video that was actually supposed to come out this morning at 10 a.m. Uh, is coming out probably before, sometime before 9.30 here. Um, I'll work on that in this, at the same time I'm talking to you guys. Um, what the heck did I just do? <laughs> there we go. Trying to split screens here. Um, so one of the things we're going to talk on tonight especially is uh, sulfur talk. I'm um, going to tie that in with gypsum, AMS talk, uh, dry fertilizer applying in general. Um, yeah, farm life. We'll try and uh, run this for a little while. Um, we'll see. Uh, we are going to start, hopefully, Y dropping tomorrow. That's if, if the mail uh, decides to come tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we were expecting a package. Well, let me back up on that. Dad was ordering the orifices earlier this week, and he ended up screwing up. His fault. It's all right, though. Uh, we caught it. It was just a minor mistake. He ordered half the amount of orifices. He wasn't thinking uh, that we need two orifices per drop because it's actually after the Y. So you have the top of the Y up here, then it branches down. Well, you got to have an orifice for each hose instead of up here at the top of the Y. So he accidentally screwed up and uh, ordered half the amount of uh, orifices that we needed. No big deal. He immediately, later that day, ordered the other half that we needed on a separate order, but we also ordered ordered sight gauges. Now, a uh, funny story on the sight gauges. When, back when we were ordering the tanks, and I told Dad that we should get 2,800 gallon, I said, uh, I, think, I think we were debating between I can't remember exactly what size tank we were actually going to get. It was either 25 or 2600. And when I did some figuring there with the applicator on the 1800 gallon tank size on the applicator, I said, why don't we go with 2800 gallon? Because it just makes more sense to get 2800 and uh, have 5600 gallon uh, total in the tender. And uh, we ended up going with that without taking a tape measure and you guys all know about that whole story. Cause I've talked about that, about the, the tanks not fitting perfectly in the tender and us having to turn them and do all that. If you guys watch that video, uh, you know what I'm talking about um, or have been in past streams when I've talked about the tanks. But anyways, uh, I made the remark about why, or uh, if he ordered sight gauges with the tanks, he's like, well, we don't need sight gauges. I'm like, I think we probably should. He's like, ah, we'll be fine. And uh, with those tanks being double walled, and what I mean by double walled, they're double the thickness of, like, say, a Snyder or Norwesco tank. So I'm just using Snyder and Norwesco as examples because those, those are known uh, name brand tanks that are known throughout the industry. Um, but uh, since those are so thick on basically th so thick, I, I can't remember offhand how thick they are, uh, you can barely... Hardly, well, on those transport tanks themselves, you can't even see the uh, level. So when we're filling, I pop the lid and I just stand there with the ladder looking in and kind of using my hand as a shadow on the inside of the tank looking in, uh, basically using my hand on the outside and looking out inside the tank with basically trying to find my shadow of my hand to figure out what level uh, we're filling at. So, I mean, it's no big deal because on filling, really, I just tell them when I go to Walden and say, hey, I need... Uh, 4,400 gallons, so 2,200 gallons in each tank. So it's not like it's a major thing of knowing how uh, when we're filling. It's just more uh, gauging or getting a gauge on how much is left in the tank. So hence why we ordered sight gauges. Um, <laughs> I, I really 
wish we would have just ordered them with sight gauges when we got them, but I don't know. We just didn't. So uh, we got sight gauges ordered, and uh, we're not going to end up putting them on right away. Uh, we're just going to say, screw it, get the orifices on, because those are actually supposed to be in the second order. Uh, those are supposed to be in, at least they should have been here, Saturday, yesterday at 2.48 p.m. from Indianapolis. Never showed up. At least I got half the orifices in the applicator right now on those drops. So as soon as those come in tomorrow, throwing those on, we're going to have a load of 28 and thiosol come out uh, or go over and get that and have that here. And uh, hopefully, uh, if all goes well, um, start Y dropping tomorrow. So that's the plan, at least. Uh, that's only if uh, the mail decides to come, which it should have been here on Saturday, which it did come. It's just I don't know why the package didn't show up. So I don't know. Uh, maybe this is just a personal request from me, but if at any point you find yourself videotaping some brush hogging, could we maybe get some new footage of that? Yep. Uh, that So on the brush hogging or bush hogging, however you guys want to call it, we just call it mowing, really. Um, we don't really typically start mowing until... And that, this is just for most years, and this year might be an exception just because of... Uh, how spread out so far this year has been compared to the other years. Um, since majority of what we mow as far as filter strips go uh, is our filter strips and uh, are basically most of those are in CRP. We cannot mow CRP ground until after such and such a date in the year. So in that, that date sometime in August so technically, we aren't allowed to touch those till that date in August. I believe it's in August. I don't think they've moved it into July yet. Um, but it's in August. I'm 85% sure on that. Um, so that's why we don't typically start mowing. I mean, we will put the sidearm on the uh, 4430 on the loader and do some road edges. And we do road edges with the 20-foot bat wing also. So um we might end up start doing that here when we get in a slow stretch, but uh, we're really not going to get a slow stretch here. I mean, typically uh, as soon as we get done with side dressing, we get about a couple weeks here uh, where we're messing with the combine and getting stuff around to uh, harvest wheat, which really uh, we got done with corn uh, this morning, uh, spraying corn. And uh, we are going to, uh, like I said, start Y dropping tomorrow and start on beans um, sometime this week, really, uh, which those of you that farm have probably heard about the dicamba being up in the air. I can't say it's banned, uh, but it being up in the air at this point. So that'll be really interesting. Very, very interesting for us. At least I know a lot of you guys as well, uh, that have any, uh, relation there with dicamba as far as, uh, being around it and using it and, uh, having dicamba resistant beans. So that'll be really interesting, especially to see how uh, that pans out. i um, not really going to touch on that too much, but we can talk about it if you guys kind of want to talk about it. So, yep. Uh, how is corn and beans coming up? So emergence wise, uh, if you planted two inches deep, which we plant corn or at least shoot for two inches, um, we can honestly say uh, two inches was almost a little too deep this year. We probably should have been around that inch and three quarter. Um, we've seen, and I really don't want to touch on this too much, but we've heard and seen firsthand uh, guys planting three quarters of an inch on corn, and phew, that's pretty shallow on corn. Um, that's where you're going to have your late season uh, issues on stability with corn. Um, and you're going to see some pretty uneven emergence. I mean, we've, I, I mean, uh, side by side with no till and conventional till, uh, conventional till, uh, corn came up a heck of a lot faster and we were very surprised on that. And lo and behold, you go out there and it's three quarters of an inch deep. And later on the, uh, the, uh, emergence is very uneven and it's, uh, not looking too hot right now. Now, as far as beans go, we plant our beans about an inch and a half and, uh, with the drill inch to inch and a half. Um, 
typically we don't ever shallow the drill up. We always want to sock those in where there's moisture. Um, Dad's told me time and time again about the story of when uh, uh, he accidentally, well, not accidentally, he shallowed the drill up and uh, because he, there was supposedly a big rain coming and uh, that rain never, ever happened. And uh, he ended up having to replant 70 acres of beans because of that, uh, an entire field. And he's never, ever had the instance of shallowing the drill up ever again with beans. So typically we're in that inch to inch and a half on beans uh, drilled wise. Um, with the planter, uh, I know a lot of you guys were wondering on uh, depth on that. We've talked with neighbors on this after uh, we planted. And a lot of the neighbors seem to plant about two to uh, inch and a inch and three quarters on beans. Uh, we put ours in that inch and three quarter to two inch. Um, we were shooting for inch and three quarter. Um, when we first started on that first pass there with the beaner, uh, with the meters on beans, um, we were down at two inches and we thought that was on a tad bit of the uh, deep side. So uh, we backed up a little bit there and went down. We were trying to shoot for about inch and three quarter. So majority of them were down in that inch and three quarter. Uh, now, when we got up into that sandy clay field north of 1250 on Marx's, we did end up backing that or uh, shallowing that up a little bit more uh, to try and shoot for that inch and a half to inch and three quarter range right there just to try and uh, get them up and out of the ground a little bit quicker. Which it's kind of weird planting beans with the planter because it seemed like the depth um, didn't really change as much as far as uh, moving the depth in general compared to, uh, when you're planting corn and adjusting the depth, um, you move it a notch and it seems like in corn, you'll, you'll, uh, change the depth a little bit, but on beans, it's, you got to move it a couple of notches just to change the depth some. So it's, it's kind of a learning curve there planting beans. Um, but, uh, I'm a big fan of it. I really, um, like them. So far, I've liked them this year. Emergence has been great on beans as far as the planted beans go. Now, granted, with the drill, I mean, it's hard to gauge even emergence on beans with the drill just because of, you know, it's just a controlled spill and singulation is absolutely next to zero on a drill compared to uh, planting them. So it's kind of hard to tell on emergence and also on population. Um as far as just looking across the field, same with the planter with beans. I mean, it's hard to tell on that without dropping the tape measure and determining um, and using the hula hoop method, obviously, and the drill um, to kind of determine what kind of a drop you got, which we still haven't done yet. I mean, I know I said I was going to do that a few days ago or last week and uh, still haven't had the time to actually take a tape measure out there and look. But uh, so far, beans look great, both drilled and uh, with the planters. So, a lot of our corn looks, for the most part, pretty good. Um, we're seeing a lot of that sulfur deficiency. Now, what we do uh, to put down majority of our sulfur down, we do uh, AMS, all broadcasted, 100 pounds, um, pre-plant by our custom applicator when he does the dapper map and potash. And it's not quite... So, I mean, for the past couple of years now, we've been using AMS. And then years past before, a uh, little stretch in there, we tried uh, gypsum. But before that, we were using AMS as well. Um, but we did try gypsum a few years ago, and it worked great. Um, completely alleviated that issue. And a few neighbors caught on to that and started using that. And they, uh, um, a couple neighbors used it, again, used it again this year. But for the past couple of years, we tried reverting back to that AMS rate and thinking that this is a little bit easier because it is a little bit cheaper to use AMS versus gypsum. Um, gypsum is a byproduct out of the uh, uh, electric plants here. Um, they also have pelletized uh, gypsum. Gyp pelletized gypsum is a little bit more expensive. We talked with uh, one of our fertilizer guys that we deal with um, from up in Michigan. He says a lot of guys up there, especially their potato guys and specialty crop guys, uh, use pelletized gypsum as well. Uh, now pelletized or pelletized and byproduct gypsum um, is essentially calcium and sulfur. Um, one of the things that uh, really promotes early vigor and growth, what we learned is calcium. And uh, so basically by putting out high, high cal lime, 
Uh, you can increase your uh, your calcium levels there. But what we're finding here with the gypsum is that it's a cure, at least for that early uh, sulfur deficiency. Now, what Dad and I were talking about earlier today, you know, with the Y dropping, you know, at this stage in the game where it's already showing that deficiency for the past week now, and we can't get out there and Y drop just because the corn's not quite tall enough, you know, when we go out with 28 or 32 with thiosol to not so much as just to fix that, but just because that was the plan program to begin with, you know, the corn is already, the damage has already been done to that corn as far as deficiency goes related to sulfur. So dad's frustrated with it because we're basically kicking ourselves saying, why didn't we use gypsum? Because we know it works. Well, you know, it's just trying to find ways to go about it a little bit cheaper and, we're really paying for it again. I can't say that's bad uh, because it's not as bad as what it was in years past because I feel the 22703S having that a uh, little bit of sulfur there in the starter that we used uh, this year helped a little bit. Not enough though. Uh, would we consider increasing that rate? I doubt it. Um, we're talking, we've, we've talked about reverting back to the 10340. Uh, mix. I know there's a 171505S. Uh, that's what we actually used uh, before the 10340 blend that we used to run before what we ran this year, which was a 22703S. And we actually spiked that rate or that blend, that 171505S, uh, with sulfur even more, which we realized before uh, or realized uh, later on. Um, before we switched to the 10340 blend, what we were actually causing there before we went to the two by two and banding that uh, starter on either side of the row, because we were only using the single disc uh, front mount holders, you know, what John Deere basically originally had on all the planters on. Um, and then uh, we learned what we were causing there with uh, the sulfur concentration blend, uh, band dropping that pH and causing some toxicity in the row. So it's very uh, interesting on what we found there. I'm not going to touch on that too much because I really don't want to reveal everything what we found there. Um, but what we've er what we're finding though is that having that sulfur back in the row is helping a little bit. Um, like I said though, it's not a cure all, and the AMS is by no means a cure all anymore, especially having it up pre plant and especially with the abundance of rain that we had this year, washing a lot of that. Uh, Sulfur, um, especially with it being a mobile nutrient, a very mobile nutrient, um, down far enough into the soil profile that it's not ex basically accessible at this point, thus causing the uh, V2, the V6 uh, sulfur deficiency that we're seeing now. So with the gypsum, you can alleviate that. And again, why didn't we use it? Well, like I said, we're going, we're trying, we were trying to go about it a cheaper way because AMS is cheaper than spreading gypsum. Well, we're just flat out next year going back to everything being gypsum and uh, having that cal that calcium in there. Uh, what our uh, uh, fertilizer guy was recommending highly is definitely had that calcium in there. And once you get into a routine of having that, you're not going to have uh uh, you're going to help build your sulfur levels a little bit more and have that calcium level a little bit higher than, and you're going to have, I guess, better yields in his theory and what he's seen firsthand with many other growers up in Michigan. So uh, with similar soil types. So, I mean, it's just interesting stuff like that. Um, you know, and back to the rest, I can't really say it's a rescue treatment because it's a planned program. I mean, we did use some LMAX if you guys followed me on that. Um, the LMAX last year worked great as a Band-Aid, and this year, again, we were just using it again as a Band-Aid, just on one field, again, just like last year. And this year didn't quite work as good. Um, again, it's a court to the acres here, putting a very minimal amount of poundage of sulfur out there. Uh, but again, it was just to try and uh, move that corn along just a little bit more until uh, uh, we get out there the Y drop. So... Uh, we had 500 gallon of thiosol that was cut with water. So it was only about four gallon per, you know, it, it wasn't when we cut that with water, it was at 12 gallons to the acre. So you're really only going to get four gallons to the acres uh, of thiosol. 
Um, so it's just a another little shot that we put on with the fur, uh, by fur, uh, fertigating there, uh, which we did yesterday, which I is actually in the new video, which I'm in the same time I'm talking to you working on trying to get that released for you guys. Um, so it's just stuff like that, trying to spoon feed your nutrients and get that optimization there to, uh, learn, uh, key nutrient uptakes and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I don't know. It's it, 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 there's just so much that I wish we could try in one year and learn in one year that you're not going to be able to learn at all in one year. So it's a lot of trial, trial and error and uh, learning a bunch of stuff that you should be doing and stuff that we already knew that we should be doing and just uh, not doing really. <laughs> so how far out are you from Y dropping? Uh, like I said, we're actually going to start uh, tomorrow. I don't know if you were in the stream or not then when I was talking about that, but we're going to start tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, that is if, like I said earlier, if the orifices, the rest of the orifices come. So uh, hopefully tomorrow. So that'll be a big learning curve um, as far as uh, coming from anhydrous especially. And, uh, and I'll be running the applicator majority of the time, if not the whole time. So I do have some custom work, uh, lined up a neighbor of ours, uh, wants me to do some, uh, side by side strips that he did within Hydra. So, so that'll be interesting. That'll essentially be our, uh, I can't say for us, but it'll be interesting just in general to see, because that's going to be a 28, uh, he's just going to use straight 28, I, I think. Uh, he talked earlier about using thiosol also, so I don't know if he's actually going to do a 28 and thiosol mix or if he's just going to get straight 28 from their farm. Um, I'm not sure. I'll have to, but, uh, their corn's only at V5 stage right now. It's only six inches tall. So it's, I've got a little bit of time there. So by the, I would say by this weekend, I'll be wide dropping it. Um, if not first part of next week, just whatever works schedule wise. And if we have any, uh, weird rain events that pop up later at the end of this week. Um, so that'll be an interesting side by side if it ends up being just straight 28, because what he did was, uh, he skipped every other pass and, uh, did anhydrous. So basically I'll go in between those passes of 16 rows of anhydrous and, uh, go through and Y drop. So that'll be really interesting, it's basically a good side-by-side. -side. If it is straight 28 that he wants me to run, uh, which he said he's just going to supply me with that, so that's going to be great. Um, we don't even have to worry about tending it. He said he'll tend me. And uh, it's only going to amount to about, I would say, about 30 acres, which isn't a big deal to me at all. It's up it's uh, up there in Laporte, so that'll be really cool uh, to run up there and do that for him and actually get a nice side-by-side. -side. It's on popcorn. Um, they raise popcorn on uh, some of their acres and uh it just so happened that this field that he wanted to do it they were putting popcorn on so uh irregardless i mean there's still uh gonna be a nice uh check there on anhydrous versus y drop and uh this is something that he's been wanting to do also um and has been following me quite a bit on that also so uh he's pretty excited about it and so am i because that'll be a good check on anhydrous versus uh 28 y dropping uh if it if it comes down to it that we're just running straight, uh, straight 28 instead of 28 and thiosol. So, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, do you have a JD Bush, uh, JD or a Bush hog brand of, uh, mowers? So, uh, we have an HX 20 and we have a woods. Um, I don't know what it is. I guess five or six foot, uh, five or six foot, uh, ditch bank mower. Um, that we have. So uh, the HX20 we bought on auction. I think that's a 2011. We bought that down at Mallory's. Like I said, we bought quite a bit of, st uh, quite a bit of stuff down at Mallory's, uh, including the combine, which a lot of you guys know about because uh, how many views that video has gotten. But yeah, so uh, we got that, I think 2012, 12 or 13, maybe 13, possibly. Uh, that replaced our old John Deere uh, 15 foot mower uh, that we actually used to chop stalks. We back in the day, uh, and I remember this because I used to do this 
also um, back about 13, 14 years ago, uh, we used to chop stalks. If he, well, probably only about, well, probably we did a little bit back about 12 years ago too. Uh, we chopped stalks and, uh, basically just mowed them off and we use the 4650 and Bob, I would throw the name out, but I'd prefer the, I, I don't think they'd, I don't think they would mind if I threw the name out, but just common courtesy, I'm just not going to throw the name out. But, but yeah, before the, uh, the vertical till and before we strip tilled, we chopped stalks and uh, worked out good just for sizing residue purposes. Um, but uh, we uh, ended up going to strip tilling, so we ended up quit uh, quitting on chopping stalks. And we ended up going away from uh, strip tilling and ended up going into vertical tilling. And that pretty much still uh, rolled us into uh, sizing residue. So there is still no need to chop stalks because we were vertical tilling and sizing the residue the way we like it. And we ended up getting the HX20 in that mix there and love it. I mean, in some cases, it would be nice to have a 15 foot mower. Um, what we were considering was getting, say, like a 4,000 series John Deere tractor, maybe even a 5,000 um, just utility tractor and put like an 8 or 10 foot mower on it on the back. But then again, uh, even though that tractor would be handy around the farm for doing smaller jobs, um, what I also got to thinking was is get like a skid steer and put a mower on the front of the skid steer because I know a lot of guys do that. And that would be really handy for mowing um, just for the maneuverability purposes and areas that you're going to be able to get into uh, with a skid steer versus a tractor. Um, so... Basically, I wouldn't mind having both, not having two mowers as far as like an eight and eight or 10 foot and then also a skid steer mower. I would just prefer one or the other, but also having both a tractor of that size and a skid steer uh, would be nice uh, for the farm in general, just because I know the benefits of having that side of the tractor and I know what we could use it for along the lines of with the skid steer as well, you know, um, which I've discussed in previous streams before about all the uses that we could use a skid steer for. So uh, just a lot of small, uh, pur smaller purchases. I can't really say a skid steer is a small purchase because it's like 80 to a hundred thousand dollars for some skid steers out there. I mean, I know you can buy one used, um, but uh, for the ones I'm looking at, like a JCB teleskid, I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that used markets few and far between really. Um, I know there's getting to be more and more used ones out there, though, so that's something uh, I can look out for uh, in a few few more years, basically down the line. So, uh, I'm just gonna try and run down the list here and try and keep up with you guys tonight, and uh, also try and get this video out for you guys as well. So, uh, what was your average soil temp when you planted? So. Uh, before we even started planting, uh, a lot of guys were actually already planting and uh, soil temp was around 40 to 45 degrees. Uh, when we actually ended up starting planting, it was right there above 50 degrees. And we did go through a little bit of a cold stretch there, which we do blame some of the emergence on our corn. Now, granted, no-till conditions, you're going to have that lag period there on conventional till versus no-till. As far as emergence goes, yes, no-till is going to take a little bit longer than conventional till just due to the uh, cooler soil temp. And it, it stands to reason. I mean, black ground is going to attract more sunlight than uh, residue-covered ground. So it's just one of those things that you have to deal with. So um, I would say average would have been about, for the start, about 53 degrees. And then on the latter half of planting, around that 58 to uh, 55 to 58 degrees. So <sighs> dicamba is banded in Illinois. We can't spray it in Illinois. It is banded. Wow. So it's banned. Hmm. Here in Indiana, the day that ban or the Ninth Circuit Court ruled on that, 
or made a ruling on three of the four uh, registered labels. Um, the everybody was freaking out, including us, because we still had some dicam, but we we haven't even sprayed beans post emerge yet, and we. We didn't know for sure what entirely that meant because it seemed like every other article that you read changed exact, like basically changed uh, what they were basically saying or what happened. You know, the first one that came out said, oh, Dicamba's banned. The next one came out and said, Dicamba's not banned. You can spray it, but retailers can't sell it. It's like, okay. Then the third one you read, it said, okay, you know, Dicamba's not banned yet, and it might possibly could be banned, or, you know, also, you know, chemical retailers can still continue selling. So, I mean, there was, you know, so many different circulations going around that you didn't know uh, what in the world was even going on. So when we went up the next day, uh, the run up to Helena, Helena told us, you're in the clear. You can go ahead and spray. We're, we're able to sell it to you guys. And we ended up picking up some more just to be on the safe side because we knew um, there was a good possibility we were, going, we were going to need some anyways. So we just wanted to be on the safe side and get it now. That way, if retailers were cut off, we already have it. So um, it's going to be really interesting, though, because I know a lot of states, especially like Illinois, spray a boatload of dicamba. And when that happens... When, you know, I know you guys over in Illinois were spraying, we're probably one of the first states to actually spray dicamba on corn. Um, there's a few guys up in our area that still spray dicamba on corn. Uh, we typically don't um, because really for us, there's really not too much of a need for it, um, especially with the residual packages that we use, um, which hopefully this year. <laughs> we uh, have a really good residual pack. Well, our residual packages this year are pretty expensive and hopefully um, they uh, do the job and uh, we don't run any, run into any issues this year, especially on beans that uh, we need to spray dicamba um, because all of our beans are dicamba resistant. Uh, they're the extend beans from pioneer. So, I mean, is this a ploy to push us into a list I really hope not because especially on the seed side, I could already tell you across the entire seed industry, it's really not going to, uh, there's not enough out there to begin with to completely replace extend. So it's like, why look at, you know, what, what, in, you know, regardless, you know, if dicamba gets banned, you know, extend beans are still going to be there for the market, you know, to market and sell, what incentive would guys have without having dicamba to replant, to, uh, to plant and buy and plant uh, dicamba tolerant beans? I mean, what's the incentive there? Because if you can't spray the key herbicide that those beans are made, you know, essentially grown for to use that herbicide on, um, it, it just, it, it just doesn't make you know, a lot of guys are just going to look into Enlist then. Yeah, there's a little bit of yield drag with Enlist, but, you know, <laughs> guys are just going to look at the fact that they can't spray dicamba and say, why in the world would we plant dicamba beans then? I mean, I can't, I'm not saying that dicamba is going to get banned because I hope to God it doesn't get banned because I see it as a really good uh, a herbicide out there, a really good tool uh, that we can use in season and also as a burn down, which we use it quite a bit as a burn down this year and it worked great. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's going to be interesting. So uh, let me quickly type up a title here for you guys and get this video pushed out to you. Um, how close is wheat harvest? Rise turning. Um, the wheat. Oh, I really don't want to talk about the wheat. The wheat's all right. It's, well, I don't know. It. <laughs> I really don't want to discuss too much on the wheat. The wheat's fine in general, but we've had some issues not directly impacting the wheat, but there again, it's going to directly impact on how we sell the wheat. It's it's a mess. Um, one of the instances that's contributing to that, uh, we actually got squared away with a neighbor on. He's, uh, that worked out good. 
Uh, he's we're, we're both uh, totally great and fine with this. Um, the other instance on what contributed to this, uh, we're really scratching our head on and kind of very frustrated with this other uh, 50% that contributed to this issue that we had or are having. And it's very frustrating on our end. So I really don't want to throw anything out there because it's, it, it's a mess. So, but as far as how close it is, uh, I would say wheat harvest is on track to being normal. Uh, what seemed to be always normal, uh, the end of June. So, uh, and right there around the 4th of July. So, uh, we only have about 70 acres, so uh, it won't take us long at all. It'll only take us like a day to get that cut, really. So uh, uh, what kind of hours uh, the port has, because we all we take all of our wheat up to the port. Because there's uh, basically they have the best bid and plus, uh, well, typically have the best bid on wheat, that is. So um, that's why we go there, so. Micronutrient success. Um, elaborate. Elaborate on that, Chris. As far as uh, micronutrient success, are you asking like on corn or what we've seen this year, what we're doing? Um, as far as that goes, are you pulling tissue and soil the whole growing season? So we actually are going to start. We actually have a meeting on this uh, Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday, we have this meeting. Uh, it's called Coffee and Crops. Uh, we got invited to this. Only a few guys, I guess, get invited to this. I didn't know about this. Um, neither did Dad. But it's kind of about talking about uh, tissue sampling. Well, it's all geared around tissue sampling um, and promoting their extractor, or extractor program that they do. So it's uh, interesting stuff like that that we're going to be discussing on Tuesday. Uh, which actually that's going to work out good. And I don't even think they planned it for that um, because actually the invite happened about three weeks ago. So uh, it's actually supposed to rain on Tuesday and so that's actually going to work out pretty good. So um, yeah. So uh, as far as going throughout the whole entire season, uh, we are going to uh, at least the plan is, and we still may do it, um, do some, uh, not on all of the ground, but on some of the ground to determine what kind of our new, what, what our nutrient level stance is on some of these fields, uh, what our nutrient levels are and, uh, kind of determine what we can kind of throw out there, uh, with the applicator to kind of alleviate some of that stress and, uh, any, and bring up some of those levels that are down, um, we're all when we do tissue samples this year, we're going to pull a soil test with it to confirm uh, what we're seeing and what we've learned. Uh, talking with uh, our fertilizer guy, that's insanely smart. This guy's unbelievable. On uh, talking about tissue sampling, he said if you're going to tissue sample, instead of religiously doing it on a say Friday at 10 a.m. every week, do it every do it not so much on a schedule like that, but determine uh, after two sunny full days, pull a sample on that third day then. Um, if it's sunny that third day, um, don't do it on overcast cloudy days. So say there's like a, a sunny day, then an overcast cloudy day, and you're pulling on a partly cloudy day, you're not going to get the best test results then, he said. So that's interesting. We just, we're, we're really new to this uh, tissue sampling. Um so yeah, this is, uh, we're still learning quite a bit with that. So, uh, wrong screen. Let me click over here and that way I can actually type. I just about closed this web page down. Holy cow. Uh, so is it worth purchasing the Yetter 500 stock devastators for no-till? Yes, I believe. In my honest opinion, uh, they do a nice job. As far as uh, if you're going to run a green cart or in general, just save on tire wear uh, across every piece of equipment that you're going to run out there um, before planning, really, um, or even after planning, really, too, uh, in a no-till standpoint when you're out there side dressing. But typically, you're not going to have a boatload of residue out there when you're side dressing. Um, so uh, depending on how thick of a rye crop you plant it into, too, if you're planting into cover crops as well, so... 
Um, in my opinion, yeah, they are a really, really nice attachment. Uh, we don't run a chopping head. We don't believe in running a chopping head just because we just see that as uh, unnecessary maintenance on a corn head. So uh, especially with us running a vertical till. So the yes, stock devastators, in my opinion, are a very, very nice attachment to have on a no-till standpoint on corn, um, on corn on corn or even corn on bean ground. So, um, yeah, I would highly re uh, recommend those. So, yeah, we've been uh, uh, we've had that sidearm. We actually bought that sidearm from Mowry's also. Um, like I said, we bought quite a bit of stuff from Mallory's, uh, like the sidearm, just, I wish it had, uh, more reach. Uh, a neighbor has one that has a, uh, extendable arm on it. So it's able to reach out farther, uh, off the side of the tractor. So that would be, uh, really nice to have. So let me finish this video up for you guys. I know I keep saying that and I just keep getting sidetracked here with all your guys' questions on here. We're going to have a Pretty good discussion tonight. As far as how long I'm going to go run, uh, run this to, I'm probably going to run this till about 10, 1030 for you guys. So let me pull up another tab here. Um, what about a large seven hour for your guys' planner? Um, yeah, I mean, you could put like a 7210 hour. I believe they make like a 72, uh, 7210 or 7200 or 7215 hour. Um, necessarily you don't need 200 horse to pull a 16 row planter. Um, you know, you can get like a 7195R. Um, I believe they make like a 7195R. If not, I'm thinking like a 69 or 6195R. Um, personally for a loader replacement though, I would consider seriously looking at say a 6195R, which like with like an H380 loader on it. Um, I feel... Um, that would be a really nice uh, overall replacement for the 4430. Not to say we're replacing the 4430 because of the, there's nothing really wrong with the 4430 at all. Um, but it's just thinking that you could replace not only not replace, but just kind of substitute the 4630 and the 4430 out of there. Not to say that we're going to get going to get rid of them because in my opinion, what I would like to do, is restore both the 4430 and the 4630 and essentially retire them, but replace them with a 6195R and have the 4430 and the 4630 still here on the farm. Because really, on a trade-in standpoint, not to be harsh towards those tractors, but those tractors are not worth trading in or selling off uh buyer, you know, just ourselves, just selling them. I mean, it's just not worth it at all to sell a $12,000 tractor and maybe a $16,000 tractor off. Yeah, that's $12,000 and $16,000. But with the 4630 having sentimental value, especially the majority of that mean with grandpa, with him buying that tractor brand new and, you know, the 4430 necessarily not really having a whole heck of a lot of sentimental value, but the fact that uh, it's just a 4430 and it's pretty cool and it's pretty well balanced with the 265 on it, the loader that's on it. I mean, it's it still would be really cool to have both of those and just have them restored and have them just basically here on the farm, like how the 730, 630, the 530, the unstyled A, the style G, and the 4020 are just here on the farm and just are fun to have. So it's just stuff like that. I mean, I'm just looking at practical uses as far as, you know, 6195R could, you know, do a mowing. It could do the, you know, do jobs that the loader does and, you know, just odds and ends basically. So just an overall round utility, larger utility tractor. So <sighs> let me finish typing this last word here and I will push this out to you guys. Um, and it should be releasing here around 930 then. So, oh boy. Uh, I got to wait on that actually. 
Um, so I guess let's back to the comments here. Uh, uh, what is that? You think you might be replacing the 4650 anytime soon? I doubt that, uh, just because of the current grain market. Um, put it this way, if corn was $4, we would consider doing something, um, possibly, but it's just not like economically it does not make economic sense just because of the fact that okay we put a hundred hours on that 4650 now a year um yeah you could spread the hours more and take hours off the 8530 with a different tractor replacing the 4650 but it just i really don't know it's gonna be a hard day to part with that 4650 because in my opinion overall that is my favorite tractor overall. Yeah, the 8530 is nice, but overall, the the 4650 is my favorite. I mean, that's the one I grew up on uh, driving, and just, I love that 4650. And that, I mean, the funny thing is, I mean, the parallelism to this is unreal. Um, Dad graduated in 82, and... We got the tractor in 83. Um, it's, you know, we got the 8530 the year after, or the year I graduated, and just similar to year uh, dad, basically, well, a year after dad graduated. So it's just kind of like, that's kind of funny on how that worked, but we ended up getting the 4650 the year after dad graduated, and we ended up getting the 8530 actually the year I graduated. Um, or actually, yeah, the year I graduated, 2018. And uh, it's it's kind of funny on how that worked. But like I said, I grew up driving the 4650. I've done, you know, I've put in a lot of hours in that tractor. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I, it's going to be hard to part with that. And again, I just don't know. if I don't know. I mean, it's funny. I mean, I've joked with our uh john deere dealer it's like so what's it even worth and he won't flat out say because i'm afraid i i think he's afraid that he doesn't want to put a price out there uh because we might get offended by it but it's just like in all honesty what is it worth um i don't know with it having about nine thousand hours on it i mean i don't know um and the overall condition it's in i mean compared to other 4650s out there i'd say it's on the uh, one of the nicer ones out there. I can't say it's the nicest. I mean, I would say it's a nice, it's a nice o overall 4650. I mean, it's not in rough condition, but it's just one of those things where it's like, you know, it's not the worst one out there and it's not the nicest one out there, but overall it's a nice tractor. So what, what is it worth? I mean, obviously it's not worth 30 grand, but you know, realistically, Matt, what is it worth? And he just won't, he won't name a price, so I don't know. I mean, in true true to the fact, though, that we're not serious yet on trading or even considering selling it, so it's just one of those things where, you know, that could be why that, uh, you know, he's not <laughs> wanting to throw a price out there, too. So, yeah. Let me finally get this video out for you guys and let me quit looking at the comments here for a second and get this video pushed out to you guys. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, crop conditions overall. Comment that, uh, where you guys are from, that you're tuned into the stream. Be sure to like this stream also. Uh, comment down below or comment in the comment section here. Uh, crop conditions overall in your area. Uh, while I finish this video up in the next minute here and uh, let me know um, how things are looking and what stage your guys' corn and beans are basically averaged at. And uh, just how things look overall, really. So... Oh, and my cousin is Snapchatting me also. I've got, like, so many different things going on at once.
Okay, we will schedule this for tonight at 9.30. Where is 9.30? Right there. Done. All right. So, back to the comments here, just because this is pretty much wrapped up. What do you think they will uh, replace dicamba with? Sprayed this for 40 years. Uh, one time, New York tried to ban spraying if mixed with fertilizer, wanted to separate. Really? That's crazy. New York tried doing that. Wow. Um, I've heard of crazy stuff trying to happen, and that's that's pretty crazy. Um I don't know. Uh, in my opinion, overall, I would say enlist. Uh, we, Dad and I, uh, we uh, went down to Sheridan, Indiana, to a uh, enlist training for reps. Um, the product itself is pretty interesting. Uh, basically, it's a third formulation of 2,4-D. Um, there's 2,4-D ester and 2,4-D amine. And basically what this is, is 2,4-D with a different formulation of salt, basically a different salt concentration formulation. And we don't use Enlist, so I just am trying to remember. Um, let me just pull up the label here real quick. What that third uh, 2,4-D element is called, I just can't remember of it offhand. It is, I already know, it's it's Enlist 1 and Enlist Duo, or not Enlist 1. It, yeah, it's Enlist 1 and Enlist Duo, but um, basically Enlist Duo is the mix between 2,4-D and, it's the pre-mix um, Colex-D, that's what I was thinking of, yeah. Um, Enlist Duo is the pre-mix of 2,4-D, uh, with uh, Liberty. So that is a really, really nice uh, package there. Um, and we saw firsthand uh, the mixes that they were using out there um, with residuals and stuff. And it's, it's unbelievable what this herbicide can do. It's just a fact there again that I was mentioning that there is a yield drag using Enlist. Um, now we will be uh, seeing firsthand this year because of quite a bit of guys this year um, put out uh, Enlist Beans. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see uh, firsthand from our customers um, how Enlist performs this year. So Because basically it's a level playing field as far as Enlist goes. Nobody has their own genetics because they're all Stein genetics. So it's just, you know, it is what it is basically for the next few years. So um, I don't know, uh, as, as far as how, what the yield difference is, nobody really knows. So I don't know, but I feel Enlist is going to end up replacing Dicamba personally. I can't wait to get into Enlist because it's just going to be a lot simpler of a program. I don't know. Frankly, I wouldn't mind spraying Enlist Duo, uh, because it just, it just seems like a really, really nice program overall using Enlist Duo instead of Enlist One, so... Sad thing is, extend yield so well, but dicamba is a selling point with them. I've talked to a lot of guys who will give up some yield for a better herbicide package. That's exactly what happened this year. The majority of our customers that uh, switched to Enlist was because uh, not so much they were looking for a different herbicide program, but because the co-op does their spraying, and the co-op was kind of twisting them in, twisting your arm essentially into getting them into Enlist because the co-op is essentially not wanting to spray dicamba at all. And I wouldn't blame them. I mean, it would be easier on their part too. Uh, less sprayer clean out too uh, with Enlist and get them basically majority of their customers into Enlist to just to overall make things easier. That's basically what we saw this year um, working with our guys. So. And it just jumped me clear down to the, uh, the bottom of the comments here. I got to scroll up and find where I left off. Uh, 
Do you know till uh, on irrigated? Yes, we know till on our irrigated ground. Oh, okay. The comments are like jumping all over the place here. I don't understand why it's keep it keeps like moving me up and down here. I'm trying to <laughs> stay on top of you guys here, and it just does not want me to stay on track here. Uh, did you buy a skid loader? No, we did not buy a skid steer or skid loader. So, um, or a tract loader because I know some of them are called tract loaders, even though I call the tract one skid steer. Still, I mean, I really don't understand that. I mean, I just. I call them all skid steers, so. Uh, so I know Ryan does a farm day. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll just have to see how, basically just see how this YouTube thing goes. I'm not, like I said before, I'm not considering quitting at all by any means. It's just, uh, for me, in order to do a farm day type thing, um, I would kind of want to have a larger fan base on here as far as following uh, in order to consider doing that. Um, but there are risks to doing that, I know. So um, I don't know. I haven't ruled it out, though, by any means. So I heard up in like, yeah, so Jake was talking about uh, the preventive plant that they had up in Southeast South Dakota. So you guys that are in the chat here uh, or tuning in right now from the Dakotas, I heard North Dakota, if anybody is in North Dakota, please voice uh, what you're seeing up there, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, what I, I've heard that there's quite a bit of old crop still out in the fields yet as far as especially corn, uh, how's it look up there? Um, I heard there's, like I said, quite a bit of corn out in the fields yet, and uh, it's quite a mess up in that area. Well, technically, Mark, the extend I Campbell label was ruled uh, on three out of the four labels or regulations there. Uh, they were trying to ban it. I mean, it, at least in Indiana, it has yet to be uh, banned. Um, we're still able to spray and uh, buy the product yet. So it's just interesting. It's going to be interesting, put it this way, about... Um, how uh, uh, this all plays out here in the next couple of weeks, if not month. Well, I caught up to you guys here in the comments. I'm actually going to work on that thumbnail real quick here to push that out. Because I see that the video is already uh, pushed out to you guys. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so uh, we're going to start Y dropping tomorrow, like I said. Um, that'll be a big warning curve there. Um, yeah, so on, but you know, talking about like the sulfur and spoon feeding, you know, we're I, we're going to look at doing uh, at least the twenty oh four again this year as far as fertigating goes. So that'll be something that we already have booked. Um, it's just a matter of applying that um, later this season. Uh, you'll be able to see that uh, in action here on Tuesday's video. Um, actually, no. Uh, yeah, I'll do Tuesday. 
uh, Tuesday's video for the gating. Um, that'll be what I filmed yesterday and today. So what's your soil CEC uh, zero to maybe five? <laughs> I know there's really no such thing as a zero for CEC, but um, that I'm dead serious on how well they are though. Um, it's uh, one to five. I mean, it's, well, I guess you could, I guess you could say zero to five, um, like 0.1. No, I'm just kidding. But still, uh, nothing really over five at all. Um, it's really low CEC soil. So our nutrient holding capacity is uh, very low in our sandy soils. That's why I'm not overly too concerned right now, Mark. I think we're just going to hopefully get through this season and uh, not have too big of an issue um, having dicamba availability. So I feel this winter we're going to possibly have uh, videos. So um, uh, or what I say, videos, I was looking at some of the comments on here, but uh, we're going to have some issues uh, of having availability of it next year. I have a feeling that we're going to end up getting pushed out of using dicamba as far as uh, for dicamba beans in general. Um, well, not just for dicamba beans, but, you know, for uses on corn as well. So I have a feeling Enlist is end up going to be pushed even harder, um, which is going to be kind of disappointing because I really enjoy um, planting dicamba beans. So just like I said, for the yield aspect of it. So really, so Florida, so is it officially banned in Florida as far as you cannot use or nor buy the product? Or is it just um, one of those things where it's in talks? Yeah, because here in Indiana, it has not been banned. I mean, there was talk. Um, especially with that whole first day with the ninth, uh, excuse me, ninth circuit court. So officially down in Florida, have they officially, I guess you could say outlawed or banned it. Because, I mean, honestly, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised that after this, like, say this winter, they actually do do something um, and make us really kind of get pushed into Enlist more. Because, in my opinion, Enlist is an overall safer program um, to use, but I don't know. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, fortunately, that's what we heard. Uh, but then we're still able to buy some as far as right now. Um, but there again, that could change tomorrow. So thankfully, we have everything so far that we need that we know of. Um, and hopefully we don't need any more uh, going forward if they decide to ban it. That's, Dan, that's a good question on that because, you know, that's something Dad and I were talking about. You know, seed companies in general are dumping out more dicamba beans than they are Enlist. Now, granted, yeah, they're going to have a boatload of Enlist beans out there to, you know, compensate for the uh, larger demand of Enlist next year. And that was before dicamba even came out. So say, you know, you factor in and take out dicamba and push e3 even more you know there's going to be a mad scramble then to get enlist and i hope that there's seed companies out there that are tearing up dicamba fields right now that are seed beans and putting down enlist because if this does uh, go into effect nationwide then like i said what will i mean there will be an 
dicamba beans available. But my big thing with that is, though, if it does go into effect, again, what is the incentive to plant dicamba beans if you cannot use the herbicide? You know, so, I mean, that's, that's going to be a really uh, big issue then. Yeah, that's the problem. Dicamba is an overall excellent herbicide. And it's just, the problem is, it's just been an abused, abused herbicide as far as how guys have applied it and not applying it when they should be. I mean, that's the biggest culprit to this whole uh, issue that we're in right now. And it's just really frustrating on where this has come. Well, Roundup beans, I wouldn't be surprised in the next five years that it ends up going away. Um, actually, uh, to scroll back up there, yeah, uh, I have been to Minnesota before. Uh, the Mall of America was actually pretty cool. Um, but to go back down to Roundup and Listen Liberty... I wouldn't be surprised within five years, if not even sooner, I would say even three years that Roundup beans just, just straight Roundup end up going away. Um, and get, and I have a feeling if this does go into effect on the, uh, on the dicamba, you'll just have Enlist and Liberty, which in my opinion, uh, Liberty is a really good herbicide and a really good program, but we just, again, prefer um using uh dicamba over liberty just because it it does a really nice job and you can use and and you have less coverage because i mean with liberty you got to increase your coverage so with glufosidate so oh, i just don't see guys playing as ten beans if you can't use i can't yeah i mean i agree i mean what's the incentive there i mean you're going to pay essentially a premium to plant dicamba beans that you can't even use a herbicide on that they're meant for uh really no other positive to them for most guys into even though they yield good see that's that's basically the thing i'm looking at here is uh uh the yield benefit there there is a nice yield benefit especially with the a series that pioneer has i mean i'm not just you know I, i'm i'm a little biased because just because we are uh seed dealers for pioneer but there again i mean uh, we have really kick butt genetics there in our A series lineup. So um, it's really hard to pull someone away unless they absolutely need to with a herbicide program change uh, to move away from Extend or the A series lineup of Extend beans because of how great they yield. Um, now, I know there's other seed companies out there that do have also uh, high yielding soybeans uh, for uh, dicamba beans as well. Um, but there again, you know, I'm again, being a little biased because we also are pioneer seed dealers. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Enlist was, uh, we knew Enlist was going to be, uh, the route anyways, because essentially Enlist is Corteva's herbicide. I mean, that, well, let me back up. Enlist was Dow's herbicide, but with the Dow and DuPont merger, you know, Enlist was kind of, well, let me back up even farther. Enlist was not Dow's thing. The 2,4-D beans were Dow's beans. And when Dow and DuPont merged, you know, it ended up being the parent company, Corteva, which Corteva ended up taking over that patent and ended up, or buying that patent or however, you know, in the transition, how that worked. But, you know, they ended up getting renaming it or rebranding it and calling it Enlist and coming out with the Enlist herbicide. So really it's going to be a win overall for Corteva if this dicamba end up, ends up getting, met, you know, outlawed, I guess you can say. I can't really say it's a win for us um, because it works. It works great and it's a great program to use and a great tool to have. Um, the only thing it's going to benefit them as is, is that it's their uh their chemical and that they can make royalty fees off of it. Um, unlike, uh, uh, unlike Corteva paying royalties to Monsanto for the, uh, the Canva herbicide as far as the trait being in the beans. So for us, yeah, we're still allowed to use Dicamba. Yeah.
So what we brought up to Pioneer in one of our meetings, or at least not just directly to Pioneer, but to our bosses and our agronomists and um, uh, product advancement guys, is why don't they make an extend and list bean? Why not put the two together and have a program like that? Now think about that. With Enlist, you get the, the resistance to Liberty and the Roundup, along with, with the Dicamba, you get the Roundup and the Dicamba resistance. You put those two together, you have a bulletproof herbicide program package as far as the Roundup, Liberty, you know, Dicamba, and 2,4-D program goes. That would be a bulletproof herbicide program, intolerant bean overall why don't they come out with something like that? Or why haven't they researched or come out with further development and develop something like that? I mean, that would solve so many issues as far as product, product advancement goes, as far as, you know, getting something out there. You know, remember back when, uh, most of you guys probably remember that farm, remember back when dicamba beans first came out and the ungodly mess that we had you know, you got Roundup, you got Liberty, and then you got Dicamba. Well, you can't spray Dicamba next to Roundup beans, and you can't spray Dicamba next to Liberty beans without smoking them both. So, you know, then there was the buffers, and then we had all the issues, and then we got it refined even more, and then this year we got it refined even more, and then boom, you know, we're in talks now, and some states actually have it banned, uh, and then we're in talks now overall that nationwide it could end up getting banned. Why not, you know, during that time, instead of looking at just making a 2,4-D bean with the Enlist resistance, or uh, sorry, not Enlist, uh, Liberty resistance with that, work on putting the, at the same time, while in development with that bean, develop at the same time or do research at the same time of developing with that trait a dicamba breeding the enlist trait into the A series or extend beans. We, I mean, I understand it's all based on the royalty thing, but work together here, guys. Come on, work together. Make something that's actually going to benefit everybody as far as, you know, a 2,4-D extend Liberty Roundup bean. I mean, that would be amazing. Put it that way. I mean, that would just solve a whole bunch of issues. No, I could. There's a whole lineup of enlist herbis, uh, enlist beans. Our only, our only thing against the enlist beans right now, us personally on our farm, is the fact that there's not a lot of Peking beans out there in the enlist, and also those are not pioneer genetic. Uh, beans, those are Stein genetics overall. I mean, everybody in the industry that's planning Enlist right now, they may say, you know, Asgro, they may say Mycogen, or, you know, they may say Pioneer, they may say Bex on the bag. That is Stein genetics. Stein genetics in the bag for Enlist. Nobody has their own genetics in the bag for Enlist unless you're Stein. Plain and simple. I mean, that's that's how it is right now with uh, Enlist. So that's why we haven't planted it, because we know there's a yield drag there. So that's why we're sticking with the Extend program, um, hopefully. <laughs> and I hope, uh, I bet a bunch of other guys are saying the exact same thing of sticking with the Extend program, hopefully. So, Yeah, I mean, that, that whole triple stack, or I guess however you want to say it, quad stack, triple stack, whatever, um, being, I mean, that would just open up the window for so many different herbicide programs and make it so much easier on maintaining weeds. I mean, you could do, you could, the versatility of programs and your weed resistant issues would go down because you're not single handedly using, say, uh, one program, the same program year after year after year, you know, like Dicamba, and henceforth causing resistance issues later on. I mean, you could change it up. I mean, 
I know a lot of guys don't like change, but I mean, if you plant that triple or quad stack, however you want to look at it, a triple or quad stack being, um, you could switch to an enlist program next year, or you could switch to, you know, just using straight Liberty if you wanted to. I mean, it's just the versatility of it would be unbelievable. And why companies haven't looked into doing that? I don't know, but yeah. To be honest, I've actually never heard of Mustang Seed. I've never heard of it. I don't know uh, where that's located or where they're based out of, if it's like a regional company or what. Um, I've never heard of Mustang Seed, to be honest. And that's what we heard too, Dan, that they were, but it was just the fact that breeding was going to take too long and they ended up scrapping the idea. And it's just like, guys, look into this more. See the bigger picture. I mean, like I just said, I mean, the versatility of that program and the resistancy of the weeds would go down. I'm not saying it's going to virtually eliminate resistancy because obviously you're going to fight that later on. But, you know, with the change up and the versatility that you can use that program on, you know, it, it would just be an awesome overall uh, bean to plant. So... That's, yeah, that's definitely true there on, yeah, Kentucky. I, yeah. So tell me where this Mustang seed is. Actually, to be honest, like I just said, I've never heard of uh, Mustang seed or Mustang Genetics, or whatever the uh, regional... It sounds like, what, it's a regional company? Oh, okay, so South Dakota, okay. So is it only, like, South Dakota, or is it kind of uh, regional, is based on, like, South Dakota, Minnesota, uh, Iowa, kind of in that realm type thing? Exactly. I mean, that's why I touched on earlier, Dan. It's just the fact that guys just use it uh, when they shouldn't. And that's kind of how we ended up getting into this mess is uh, neglect of prop, uh, proper application use, basically. Which is just really, really frustrating when it boils down to it. So we're gonna we're praying, uh, doing quite a bit of good discussion here on Dicamba, but we are going to run the stream still till about nine thirty, uh, or nine thirty, ten thirty. Sorry. Um, so yeah, we'll just keep this going and uh, run this till about ten thirty. I do have a new uh, new video out, so if you guys want to hop over there and check that out, I'm perfectly fine with that. If you want to leave the stream to check that out, but uh, like I said, we're gonna run this till about ten thirty. Um, hey, Brandon's here. Awesome. So, but yeah, I mean, it's just frustrating stuff like that on why they don't make a, however you want to call it, a triple or quad stack or push that farther into development. I don't know. My thing is it's probably just majority of uh, royalties playing into that, uh, which doesn't surprise me there so i don't know so uh what else you guys want to talk about besides uh dicamba and sulfur Because like I said, we'll run this till about 10.30 and uh, next live stream will be next Sunday then. And I know uh, for those of you that are probably wondering, I didn't do a discussion board for this stream, like even though I said I was and I forgot. Uh, I just got busy and I completely forgot.
So Mustang Seeds is Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Okay, so that's that's interesting. That's probably yeah, that is definitely why then why I've never heard of them. Um, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, what else do you guys want to talk about besides uh, dicamba, um, sulfur, fertigating? I mean, I know I touched on fertigating a little bit there. Um, I didn't really talk on replant, but we kind of discussed replant in the last stream. So, so my uh, my vlog setup. Like, uh, kind of elaborate on that question, like the uh, how I do my vlogging with the GoPros, because I can grab one right. Where's my? I thought I had my stuff in here. Well, I know my other two are over in there, but to third plant. Wait. 900 acres of corn to third plant. So elaborate on third plant. Are you talking like second replant? Because that's crazy. I've never heard of that like happening really. Nine hundred acres of re replant. I mean, this is. I, holy cow. Wow. Wow. That is, wow. Whereabouts are you located, Peter? Wow. That, wow. I, I can't get over that. 900 acres of re replant. That, wow. That's crazy. So air reels, uh, I guess we'll just wait on Peter's response there, but air reels on bean heads. What are, uh, so Ryan must be retyping that or rephrasing what he's asking me there, but so it happens a lot because we need tile, but we have a clay. Oh, okay. So you're in a clay or soils then. Okay. That makes sense. But Wow. Northeast. Oh, okay. So that makes sense. Northeast Missouri. I heard that area got pretty hit, uh, hit pretty hard. So, wow. Re replant. I've, <laughs> wow. That's crazy. I feel for you guys. That's insane. We're supposed to get a half inch out of that rain on Tuesday, at least. I don't know. Uh, we're supposed to get like 35 to 40 mile an hour winds with that also. So, So air reels on bean heads, what are my thoughts? So we, let me, I'll back up quite a ways here. We ran a 925 John Deere and ran an air reel on it, a uh, Crary air reel. Uh, when we went to a larger head, we bought a 36 foot Crary head from Mowry's uh, that actually came out of Canada. Crary for a stretch there made their own grain heads. Basically, it was a John Deere grain head. Um, basically, paint scheme of uh, Crary's liking. And they uh, had an air, their air reel on it. We ran that for about two, two years, I would say. Two, maybe three. Um, ended up selling it down at Mowry's. And it ended up going back to Canada. And that was a 36-foot head. So kind of an oddball size there. It was 36 foot. And then we went to a MacDon, uh, McDon FD70 35 foot draper, what we currently have now and what we're going to be running still this fall. So what are my thoughts on that? Um, we overall really like them. Problem is they take a lot of horsepower to run, especially on an auger head with the amount of horsepower an auger head takes. 
then add a aerial system onto that. That takes quite a bit of power overall then. So uh, I would like to put an air reel on a Draper head. Yes, like what Mark just said, Millennial Farmer, Zach, he put a air reel on their uh, John Deere Draper that they got recently um, last year. Um, I like the concept of putting an air reel on a Draper uh, just to help reduce loss, especially from shatter. Um, so that's... Uh, so you so you spray your wheat worth around uh your spray roundup on your wheat neck. I've heard of guys doing that. I just uh haven't really talked to anybody that's done it. But yeah, so that back to the air reel thing. Uh yeah, so that is uh something I would like to do someday though, is uh put an air reel on the draper for sure. So why elaborate that? Uh, uh, elaborate on that, Nick. Are you doing that? Is that like a planned program, or is that something uh, to help bring the wheat off earlier for double crop beans or something? I'm gonna work on getting a thumbnail ready for you guys on here. I mean, I know the video is out, but. Yeah, that's really interesting. I've never heard of, I mean, well, I can't say I've never heard of it. I've talked to guy, or I've heard of guys doing Roundup on wheat, um, but I've never actually have talked to uh, somebody that's done it. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Nick. So like I said, we'll run this stream to uh, 1030. Right now, I'm just working on uh, the new video out that's right now. Um, we're out right now. And uh, trying to get that finished up for you guys. Yes, it's out, but uh, just trying to put some last minute touches on it for you guys. So ever, ugh, ever thought, ugh, geez, ever thought about a John Deere 4620? Yep. And a 4520 and a 4320, that would be nice to have on the farm someday. It's just one of those things where um, you guys spend the money to play, basically. And right now, the way I see it, um, there was some ground for sale. And no, uh, we did not end up bidding on it because uh, the guy wanted basically face value for it. And technically in our opinion, face value has fallen out of realm here right now with the coronavirus going on. Um, right now I'm just working on the thumbnail, but I'll talk with you guys while I'm doing it. Um, they were, I'm not going to discuss what they were asking, but in our opinion that it was worth $2,000 less an acre based on uh, the way it sat. And it just, I don't know, never really panned out. And it's, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see who ends up with it because we know a couple of people that bid in on it. Um, basically, what I'm focusing on instead of going into debt for 30 years and, you know, essentially making basically the return on that ground all going to the payment for that ground would I rather um, pay land payments right now or pay equipment payments right now that go towards overall improving uh, yield on the farm? 
overall, over, like basically improving our overall top end yield. Personally, uh, personally, I would rather uh, overall increase our overall top end yield or invest in something that's going to increase our overall top end yield just because uh, what in the world's going on here? I'm looking at the other video right now, but uh, basically invest in something that's going to increase our overall top end yield. Now, I'm not saying that ground doesn't increase your overall top end yield. I'm just saying uh, the fact that, you know, there really isn't return on the ground unless you have the capabilities to uh, have a larger return, such, uh, such as like raising tomatoes or... Um, raising a lot of specialty crops on them in order to gain that return based on uh, how much per acre um, you're gonna spend on the ground. So it, in my opinion, my money is better well spent instead of investing in ground right now, looking at overall increasing our yield, especially our top end yield really um, across all of our acres. Um, and equipment purchases, not like a combine or a planner. Well, I can't say a planner. Um, not like a combine um, purchase because necessarily we're not, that, that's not increasing yield. That's just more uh, increasing your overall efficiency. But um, unless you're buying a gleaner, um, then I would definitely recommend looking at something different to increase your yield. Not bashing the gleaner, guys. I'm just messing with you guys. Um, <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, it, it's, I mean, that's my opinion on it. I mean, looking at the fact that, you know, I'd rather invest in equipment purchases that are going to increase again, yield that's going to correlate to increase in revenue, uh, and there look at, uh, increasing our buying ability to purchase ground. Um, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it because essentially I don't have a whole heck of a lot of risk right now as far as uh, um, the purchases I could be making. So, you know, we're, we're kicking the idea around about being able to do our own spreading. Um, they it's one of those things where do we have the capabilities to do it next amount of dollars that we spend having just somebody spread it versus taking those dollars and putting that towards a payment on a pole type if not self-propelled spreader um the only the biggest thing that's held us back on that is we don't have the capabilities, at least we didn't think we did, until we sat down this, well, I'll back up on that. We, most of you guys know we have that tanker that we use for transporting our starter and our uh, 28 and to the pivots. And we, uh, what the heck, why won't it save? There we go. Um, over the years, that aluminum tanker with the phosphates in it uh, has essentially eroded it or corroded it quite a bit. And we're trying to figure out what to do with it. We thought about making it into a water tanker eventually uh, for tending to a sprayer. Um, you could do that or have extra water storage. Um, but we got to thinking it just wouldn't really work out because it's like if you're going to have a tanker you're going to want to have basically a setup somewhere to like how larsons have their setup because you're not just going to pull water out to the field you're going to have the tent you're going to want basically that's where i would want my band tray or tender to be there to just overall replace a tanker setup so so that went back to square one on the drawing board of what to do with the tanker and we were, for the past week and a half, we've been talking about this, about being able to do our own fertilizer. And just, we keep going back to that square root of, 
we don't have the capabilities to store and handle dry fur. So what do we do? So we have this tanker and, you know, I brought up the idea of take the 4430 by two brand new gravity wagons, which two brand new gravity wagons aren't bad at all in price. Um, say two 400 bushel gravity wagons. And depending on what you got, you could have like 24 ton between those two gravity wagons and have and pull a uh, conveyor behind that. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but you got to pay the delivery fee of having fertilizer brought out, which to be honest, we, I, I wouldn't, dad doesn't know for sure. Neither does grandpa, nor do I on what co alliance would charge to bring out dry fertilizer. So we got to thinking, it's like, so what do we do? Well, dad brought up the idea because he basically took my idea and kind of put a twist on it saying, Take the tank itself, that 6,000-gallon tank or 65, 6,000 or 6,500-gallon tank. I can't remember for sure offhand what it is. Um, I know it's at least 6,000. Take that off. Take that axle that's under it or the, the axles that's under it and the fifth wheel plate. Essentially make uh, that big nightmare about your about spray. Wait, what? I'm not really sure what you mean by that big nightmare about sprayer. I don't know what you mean by that, but take the tank off of that. Take the axles that's under it and the fifth wheel plate and everything. Make a platform. Put two 400 bushel gravity wagons up there with the uh, augers that I guess uh, mount augers onto the gravity boxes or... Um, conveyors because i know you can also put conveyors on there personally i'd rather put conveyors on them instead of the augers because conveyors would handle uh anything you put in there a lot gentler than what an auger would um as far as fertilizer goes it wouldn't really matter but say if you want to put uh rye in there i mean it'd probably be uh it would handle rye seed a lot gentler put two gravity boxes on there gravity wagons with no uh uh running gears and then like i said put two augers on them one on each box, and you have just successfully built a custom dry fertilizer tender. Not only that, a seed tender, if you absolutely wanted to, for rye. So essentially you would have 800 bushel of rye that you could use to tend for when you're uh, spreading rye seed in the fall uh, when you're seeding cover crops. That's just something that we're kicking around with because, I mean, it's just just an idea that we've come up with. Um, and you, then you would have the capabilities to essentially take that with the semi and up, go up to Union Mills, up to Co-Alliance up there to their dry fertilizer hub and get dry fertilizer. Now you would still need the 4430 to load lime or gypsum. No big deal. But it's just an idea. I mean... I don't know. Just an idea that we had um, that would repurpose it very well. Um, I don't know. That's just, uh, like I said, just an idea. Well, technically, I mean, we don't have an investor with our ground. I mean, none of none of the ground that we've purchased or are looking someday to purchase or try and purchase uh, is not done alongside an investor. I mean, this is all us sticking our neck out there on our own to try and swing this ground. So that's why I'm saying there's no investor deal here. I mean, this is all 110% us. Do you remember Pioneer 1016 uh, vaguely? I think around that time I uh, was not directly, totally uh, involved as what I am with the Pioneer business back then, but I do remember the number. I don't remember too much about the number, but yes, I do remember that number.
So we're going to run this for about another 15 or so minutes yet. Um, any basically last minute discussion questions, go ahead and shoot them out there right now. And uh, we'll go ahead and I'll try and get those answered for you guys before we go ahead and end this at about 1030. Uh, go ahead and look forward to a new video. Uh, actually, there's one out now. Um, and so four and a half bushel. Wait. So, Peter, wait, hold on. So four and a half bushel on 70 acres. Are you talking like yield uh, as far as? it was four and a half bushel overall better, or are you actually saying it yielded four and a half bushel uh, in 2012? Which that wouldn't surprise me being 2012 being a drought, um, but it's uh, just kind of elaborate on that. Oh, I understand. I see what you mean by nightmare. Yeah. I'm doing pretty good. Oh, geez. We've had the amount of stories I could tell you about combines and uh, tractors burning. Um, the 4650 uh, caught on fire. Yeah, 4650 caught on fire one time while we were doing custom work. That's a story for another stream, though. Actually, I'd rather... Eventually, when I can get dad in here to do live streams, because he doesn't really understand the whole live stream thing. Um, and like I said, he's never actually taken the time to watch any of the vlogs just because he's, I don't know, uh, just not really into the whole YouTube thing as far as sitting down and watching other guys essentially talk about farming as far as on a level like what I do and like what Chet's doing and uh, or Larson's doing and what Zach does and Ryan and uh, Brian and Cole and all, you know, uh, and Alex and Ron, you know, so it's, he's not totally into that kind of thing. He'd rather watch like an agron a totally agronomic based video if he wanted to on YouTube. So, but eventually here we'll get him on the live stream and that'll be something that we can talk about for sure on, uh, <laughs> the 4650, uh, catching on fire. How many times the 9650 caught on fire, uh, the horror stories of the 8820 catching on fire and how he figured out why the 8820s or the 20 series caught on, catch on fire. The reasons behind all that, uh, looks like I'm a little sunburnt there on my shoulder. Um, but, uh, yeah. So eventually, um, when we get him in on the streams here, I'll, uh, we can talk about burning equipment. <laughs> oh, geez. I couldn't imagine watching something uh, burn to the ground. I, I mean, I couldn't imagine like seeing a combine completely burn to the ground. I, I We've never had that happen before or a tractor burn completely to the ground. Um, but I, 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 I couldn't imagine. Holy cow. Burnt on the road. So wait, hold on. Explain that one, Ryan. How did, what happened there? Holy cow. I'm bringing, about, bringing out everybody's horror stories tonight. <laughs> Four tractors and one combine completely burned down. That, wow. See, all of our ground right now is completely paid off. So, I mean, we, we don't have a risk in ground right now as far as uh, any ground payments or anything like that. So this would have just been another whole 30 year deal uh, that I would have had to deal with. And I, for that kind of price, there's really no reason to stick my neck out there knowing that there's absolutely no return at all. And you would actually have to pull money from other fields or other farms in order to justify that farm. Uh, or those fields. So it's kind of like why, you know, your, your break even return. So why bid over that? You know, I mean, it's just one of those things. So that's why, I mean, 
I mean, you'll hear me time and time again, every video uh, talk about um, Now I'm just reading another comment from another video here, but uh, you'll hear me time and time again talk about uh, economic return and ROI being the biggest factor right now, uh, just because that is something that is constantly going through my head right now as far as what to improve on and uh, ways that we can go about doing some certain things on the farm. Oh, geez. Holy cow. On an S670? Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. That. Wow. All I can say to that, Ryan, that, that's insane. Jeez. Completely burned down to the ground, Ryan. That it just gone. Seven, my goodness, seven hundred hours. That's ah, uh, wow. <laughs> it's funny reading some of these comments. Some people are commenting. I'm glad you guys had seed to replant, but it stinks you had to replant though. Oh, geez. <laughs> Yeah, the amount of electrical equipment essentially that is run on the S series is crazy. Um, it was a big step up for us going from a 9650 to an S690. Yes, an S690 is more combined than what we need, but most of you guys know the story uh, behind the 90 or the uh, us going to an S690 instead of going to say like an S680 or a 9870. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've talked about that time and time and time again. So yeah, that's that's insane, though. I like I said, I could not imagine a combine burning down uh, completely to the ground. Wow. Well, uh, we got about 10 minutes here. What else do you guys want to talk about real quick here uh, before I end up ending the stream? And uh, instead of talking about horror stories. <laughs> oh, if you guys, uh, I guess I could talk about this too. I wish I talked about this in the beginning of the streams. Um, you shut the, wow holy cow you guys had to shut down the highway for three hours that's crazy um if you guys want to buy warner farms merchandise you can do so here at this link like i said i will have hats uh later on this year and some other merchandise items right now it's just t-shirts and sweatshirts um but i will have more available uh as far as a uh, variety of colors eventually here and uh, hats and uh, some other merchandise items. And also, if you guys want the Snapchat, there's that. And same goes for the Instagram. I post on those, it seems like, daily. So, I do have a Facebook and I do have a Twitter, but both of those, uh, the Facebook I try and keep more for uh, uh, basically uh, friends in the area um, and family. And then uh, the Twitter, I, I barely use Twitter. I mean, it just, I don't know. Twitter's just... I never really wanted it to begin with, and I just ended up getting it, and it's kind of like, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Twitter. 
You can, but it's just a cleaning capacity. The cleaning capacity is the same as an S680. Most guys don't realize that. And an actual, the 2016 S680 that we demoed, Mark, uh, actually had more cleaning capacity than our S690. Which is kind of, for us, hard to believe, but the S680 and the S690 have the exact same cleaning capacity, except I think in like model year 2016, they ended up changing that. So pretty bizarre. We didn't know that. We had no idea on that until uh, we started demoing uh, the S680. Now we had no intent in buying that S680. The whole, the whole reason why was to uh, demo that uh, 40 foot Draper from John Deere. And it wouldn't work compatibility. It wouldn't work on our uh, S690 just because of the hookup style. Um, and uh, without them changing something into single point hookup. And so our dealer wasn't going to bring it out. And I told him, you're just going to have to bring out a combine. And he kind of stammered around and I'm like, I'm dead serious. You're bringing out a combine. If you want us to even consider that John Deere Draper and he stammered around a little bit more and he said, oh, I'll get back with you half hour later while we were doing custom work still that same day. Uh, McDon called uh, because I emailed McDon and asked him, Hey, is there any chance uh, we could get a FD 140 out here? And Glasscock said, yeah, we'll, we'll get with you. And I gave him dad's phone number and they called up dad. And a half hour later, after I got done talking with Matt, dad called me up and said, well, you're getting an FD 140 out. And uh, I texted Matt, our salesman, and said, hey, uh, Glasscock's bringing me out an FD-140. I expect uh, John Deere Draper also to be coming out. He's like, well, oh, well, I suppose I can do that uh, maybe next week. I'm like, that's fine. I'm like, that's when they're bringing us out the FD-140 next week. So uh, we'll run them side by side and see how we like them. So, and I talked in previous streams about my thoughts on that. So I'm not going to jump into detail here with only about five minutes left in the stream, but uh, yeah. I don't know. We were going to get a uh, 8245R brought out with the applicator when they brought that out, but that never happened. I don't know what the deal was with that. I was actually going to get to run that 8245R on the drill and that never happened. I don't know. It, it just seems like he dropped the ball twice now. And it's just like, come on, Matt, bring that out. I want to demo it. That'd be pretty cool to run. Yeah, Twitter does seem boring. I mean, overall, it just seems so boring. I mean, it just, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of it. I hardly post on there. And it just doesn't seem fun. Well, with only about five minutes left in the stream here, I really appreciate you guys all joining in. And uh, like I said, I will have another live stream coming out um, uh, next Sunday. Uh, let me know how you guys like these live streams overall. Um, oh, jeez. And uh, I will hopefully continue doing these live streams if you guys continue to like them. And uh, that way it gives you guys uh, an update on what's going on with you. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. Um, yeah, so hopefully this will give you guys a good update on everything that's going on with the farm besides uh, when I release videos. Uh, next video, besides the one I came out with tonight, I will release one Tuesday. Um, uh, probably one on Wednesday, if not Thursday, just depending on when I get around to edit it. And, uh, like I said, uh, between side dressing, uh, all of our corn and some of the beans and side dress, uh, and then all this, basically all, all of our spraying that we have to do is nothing but post-emerge on beans. And then quickly flowing into that, we got a, uh, wheat harvest 
And then between all that, we got irrigation going on um, and fertigating. So there is going to be quite a bit of uploading going on. Um, I'll probably squeeze in a few hay videos, uh, which those of you that don't know, we do have uh, alfalfa this year, not us. Uh, well, we, it's our alfalfa that we run it out. So it's technically not us that has to bail it or do anything uh, with it. So, but I will, since it's one of my best friends that's uh, bailing it, uh, maybe we'll uh, jump in the tractor with him sometime and do uh, some videoing in there with him. So um, basically, I don't know, I can learn some of this stuff on the alfalfa because I learn about, or I know about this much on alfalfa. So uh, uh, that'll be something really cool for me to look into and see uh, or learn more on the alfalfa side of things. So. So anyways, yeah, I really appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to give this stream a like on the way out. And uh, like I said, next video uh, Tuesday. Uh, next video probably after that one's your Thursday. And like I said, we'll just, I'll try and keep you guys updated the best I can on the community, uh, community tab. And uh, like I said, also, um, hopefully... Uh, content will continue to be pumping out here more and more and more um, because pretty much it's not going to slow down here anytime soon, uh, especially with everything that's in the pipeline and going on. Uh, we do have a demo coming up, uh, an Oxbow. Not sure on the model. I would imagine it'd be a 7550 uh, sprayer coming out. Uh, 100 or 120, I'm not sure on Boom yet. Um, but that sprayer will be coming out uh later this summer after wheat harvest so we'll get to play with that a little bit this summer um so that'll be pretty cool so you guys can look at that um i'll get more details on that uh as time progresses so uh anyways it is 10 30 right now um i'm gonna kind of play with some uh footage for tuesday's video a little bit here and uh, I will catch you guys in the next live stream. And you guys can look forward to a uh, new video on Tuesday on uh, basically fertigating. And you guys can hop on over and check out the latest video that released tonight. So anyways, thanks for watching, guys. And I will catch you guys in the next live stream and next video. So uh, thanks for watching.